AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome and is caused by the human immunodeficiency virus 1, the HIV-1, and we now know that there is a second one. Structurally a little bit different, perhaps more common in Africa, but producing the same sort of clinical results, the human immunodeficiency virus 2. When I was a dental student in 1989, there were 686 clinical cases of AIDS in the United Kingdom, and they reckoned that there were 30,000 possibilities. Five years later, when I qualified in 1994, there were 2,431 cases of AIDS in the United Kingdom, and they reckoned that there were 40,000 possibilities. Today, in 2014, they reckon that there are 80 to 100,000 possibilities in the United Kingdom. What do I mean by a possibility? I mean patients who are positive to the HIV-1 or the HIV-2 virus. That means they have antibodies. That doesn't mean they're all going to develop AIDS, but it means that there is a risk, that there is a chance that they may do so. In this country, in England, Majority of cases are seen in London and in Scotland, majority of cases used to be seen in Edinburgh because of the drug trafficking in Edinburgh. You rarely see them down here, but I practice dentistry in Havant and when you do, it's in, probably in the haemophiliacs which need dental treatment. Well now, the risk groups. AIDS patients used to be, majority of them used to be, Promiscuous homosexuals. These were gay men which had multiple partners. Secondly, you used to see them, and we still see them in the hemophiliacs, which were treated with blood and blood products, which up to 20 years ago, which was not tested for the HIV-1 and the HIV-2 virus, and contained contributions from many patients. Thirdly, it is seen in the intravenous drug abusers which share needles and are likely to pass it on from subject to subject. It is probably more common in prostitutes. And it is seen in babies of infected mothers. And if you've had an organ transplant from someone with AIDS, it has happened, it is un unfortunate, but you can contract AIDS that way. And if you receive cells, I mean, the classical case was the sperm bank in Australia where neonatal AIDS was contracted because the sperm was infected. But today, majority of cases are seen in people, heterosexuals, which are having unprotected sex. So it's not confined to the gay community. And also, you have to be very careful about having blood transfusion. Particularly so, where they are not routinely testing for the HIV-1 or the HIV-2 virus, and that is particularly so in Africa and South Africa. And so you have to be very careful about that. Please note that it is not an infection of dentists, doctors, nurses, and health workers. And the chances of us picking it up is remote. It is found in blood and semen in particular, and to a degree found in breast milk and saliva. But you need a lot of it in order to run a real risk. So that blood and hemophilia, blood and intravenous drug abuse, semen and prostitution, semen and homosexuality, semen and heterosexuality from promiscuity, that is how it all fits together. Now there is a great argument and debate where these viruses come from. Most of us believe that they've been around for some time and people have done studies on blood which we first started collecting it back in the 1940s and 50s and we have found evidence of infection there so it's not that new some people think that it comes from africa and nidus from africa where it's still a very important source and some people even think that it comes from monkeys where there are similar viruses causing the same sort of problems and it, therefore it could be a derivative from that now, what does AIDS do to you? Well, it does three things to you, if you remember. It causes unusual infections, it causes unusual neoplasms, and it involves the central nervous system, the brain. 
Those are the three things that it does to you. How does it do those three things to you? Well, it ruins your immune system and it attacks what are called T4 sites on lymphocytes and kills them and therefore diminishing your immune response. But worse than that, it can replicate inside lymphocytes and leave the lymphocytes and get into other cells. And because it's a retrovirus and therefore has a transcriptase, it can get into the cellular DNA of other cells. So in the end, you're left with a general infection and not just of T lymphocytes. Now people have worked out the sort of things that happen if you have a risk of AIDS. And as I said to you, there, you could be HIV positive and there are 80 to 100,000 people in the United Kingdom alone that are HIV positive. You may therefore be HIV positive and you may be a healthy carrier and you may be a healthy carrier forever and that's the end of it. And there may be no problems at all. Some of them will have an acute illness like glandular fever and I stress that to you when I was talking to you about glandular fever. Some of them will have a thing called persistent generalized lymphadenopathy. In other words, they have generalized enlargement of the lymph nodes. And that may be the only feature that they have and they may continue and be healthy forever after that. Some of them have a thing called AIDS related complex. In other words, they have a series of minor infections. You need not worry about these things. What it amounts to is that if you have AIDS, you may be well. If you have AIDS, you may teeter on the borders with lymph nodes. If you have AIDS, you may have a series of minor infections, but unfortunately, between 10 and 100%, and it varies from studies to studies and series to series, but we can safely say, it's be reasonable to say, that 30% of them will go on to develop AIDS and will therefore develop unusual infections, unusual neoplasms, and the involvement of the central nervous system. Well, the risk groups, AIDS patients used to be promiscuous homosexuals, and if we were to say that there were half a million homosexuals in this country, and that's just a guess, it is reckoned that they have a 15% involvement. So 15% of them would be HIV positive. In the hemophiliacs, which we know the figure, that's 7,000 or so, they have a 30% involvement. That figure should now be zero, because we routinely check the blood. In the intravenous drug abusers, it is reckoned that there are 60 to 150,000 intravenous drug abusers, and they have a 10% involvement. So you can see the risk within each group. What is the importance to you? A budding dentist or a doctor, a GP or a GDP, if you have a patient with AIDS, I mean, once patients develop AIDS, once they have proper AIDS, they die, full stop. That's the end of it. I mean, there were drugs like Zygogodine, and there are drugs these days, but once patients develop full-blown AIDS, they die. It's a very serious illness, and they die of infection, and a million point seven 100,000 people die every year because of it. Now, what is your role within this? A budding dentist, a budding dental student, a GP or even a GDP. So if someone sits in your dental chair, a variety of things may come your way. And you may therefore see severe herpes simplex infection of the mouth with vesiculation and ulceration. You may see angular colitis. You may see thrush caused by candida albicans and no ordinary to ordinary thrush, which you have seen underneath dentures of elderly patients. But if you see a young person with thrush, apart from thinking of diabetes, apart from thinking of antibiotics, you should also think of AIDS. That thrush sometimes goes well past the tongue into the oesophagus and you see this cobblestone appearance and you can see the white lesions and if you try to remove that it would leave an ulcerated surface, a bleeding surface. These patients are prone to other infections so you wouldn't be surprised if they had hepatitis, hepatitis B. 
And in that case, you wouldn't be surprised if they were joined us. And if they were, you would put them on the good light, depress the lower eyelid, and check the sclera, and make sure that they are joined. Some of these patients will have an acute illness like glandular fever, which I stressed that to you earlier on. And some of them will have lymphadenopathy. Some, sometimes that lymphadenopathy becomes malignant. So you get malignant tumors of the lymph nodes, and that is called lymphoma. But the most important thing that you would see is a thing called Kaposi's sarcoma, which is a very vascular tumor. And I will come back to you in a minute. How do we prevent AIDS? Well, through education. We heterosexuals are being encouraged to practice safe sex. Homosexuals are being encouraged to have safe sex. Hemophiliacs, the blood is being routinely tested and is being treated with heat so it kills the virus. Prostitutes are encouraged to use a sheet and Education, education especially so in the third world countries. If you have a patient with AIDS, I need not bother telling you that you have to be careful. Careful disposable of sharps, careful techniques, use of gloves and goggles, and great emphasis to spilt blood and saliva. Now the most characteristic, unusual, infection that these patients get is a thing called pneumocystis pneumonia. It's a very severe pneumonia and is caused by a protozoa called the pneumocystis corona. And sometimes you see it on the left, sometimes you see it on the right, but it's usually bilateral. The lungs become solid in the middle and they cannot breathe very well. And you can stain it with silver and with that method you can see the protozoa not a virus, not a bacteria, a protozoa, like an amoeba. You can see it in the lining of the wall. But the most characteristic, unusual neoplasm that you see is a thing called Kaposi's sarcoma. It's a very vascular tumor. And it's dark blue and black and purple in appearance. And interestingly enough, it used to be only recorded as occurring in patients with African AIDS. Because as you know, African AIDS started well before ours. But these days we see it in 20% of patients which have Kaposi sarcoma. It affects internal organs and that of the skin, but mainly on the face, on the end of the nose, but particularly so on the lower eyelid. You see a blue purplish structure and it's very distressing and it's very upsetting for these patients. Sometimes you see it in the mouth, which looks a little bit of an overgrowth, like an epilus, as if they were having anti-epileptic treatment. And the thing about Kaposi sarcoma, as you know, is that it metastasizes widespread and it disseminates and kills them. I hope this has been helpful.